Thank you for that introduction, and it's such an honor. Um, it was such an incredible honor, a life hashtag life goal moment, to be invited. So thank you very much. Um, first of all, I just want to apologize for my slides. Not the content. That's obviously lovely. That's one of my cats. That's perfect. Nothing wrong with the content. But um, I had to put the pictures together in the travel lodge, and I couldn't download the design function. So that they're just plain pictures coming up. I'll give you, you see? Nothing flashy. So you have to imagine it's like a Prezi or something. I feel I've turned into one of those people. You know when you end up co-teaching with a sort of semi-retired professor who doesn't do IT? And so <laughs> you end up redoing all their slides. So now my slides are like his, right? And I've got no junior person to do them for me, so they're shit. But anyway, just have to imagine a big Prezi um, presentation in your minds, in your sociological imaginations. OK. So, in case the um, Daily Mail might be listening or watching the BSA conference, I'm going to start with a trigger warning. Yes. Um, because I am going to be talking about sensitive topics and topics that should alarm us all, and I will be raising legitimate concerns, and I will be just asking questions about this whole area. But seriously, I am going to be talking about some sensitive stuff, so I do want to make a disclaimer about that. So I'm going to talk about rights and freedom of speech and censorship and identity and citizenship. So far, sounds like my first year sociology syllabus, maybe. But actually, I'm going to talk about my experiences of sharing my academic writing and research in the public sphere and engaging with the so-called culture wars in the media and including in social media. And I'm also going to talk a bit about how this context doesn't just intersect with my research and my research topic, but also how it affects our whole sector and all of the work that we're doing, actually. So I will be including um, a bit of a rant about the Tories and their anti-woke campaigns. And I hope that's allowed, but I'm up here now, so here we go. Um, so I'm not just going to be talking about the actual uh, content of my work. Um, but also about the context that I'm doing it in and the doing of it as well and what that involves. So my work is on trans rights and the framing and erasure of trans masculine voices in public discourse and the history and legacy of radical feminist theory on trans inclusion. That might be ticking metrics um, for many of you, but in sociology, there are differing views on these subjects, sometimes fiercely opposing views as well. There may well be differences of opinion um, in this room, just as there are out there in the world, of course, of which we are a part and not apart from. But hesit hesitancy to speak about these issues that the media tells us every day are scary and controversial, it leaves a gap and one that, unfortunately, polarizing individuals and groups are all too happy to jump into, and that only further excludes discussion and attention. So there are many reasons that I decided to write about this topic, and one was that the media coverage of the gender wars, as they're being called, I saw worlds in that coverage that I recognized and that I have been a part of for decades but they were being presented as warring camps, as some sort of natural enemies without any common ground. And I knew that the reality was much more complicated than that. I've been involved in feminism, as Mark uh, suggested at the, said at the beginning, for a long time. Um, I joined a women's peace camp in my teens, inspired by Greenham Common. Excuse that awful haircut. It was all the rage. <laughs> I was all the rage. I was so on trend with that haircut, let me tell you, at the time. Um, yeah, so I did that for a while, and then I lived with radical feminists who were influential in founding, the, uh, founding feminist infrastructure like Women's Refuges, Reclaim the Night, Rape Crisis. I volunteered at the Feminist Archive. I worked for the International Conference on Male Violence Against Women and Children in 1996. And then I went on to work in and with the women's sector. And I set up domestic abuse prevention education programs and anti-bullying programs in local government. 
I founded the London Feminist Network in 2004, and we revived the London Reclaim the Night March. But along also, alongside all of that, I was also involved in queer communities, and of course, these worlds overlapped, or at least they did then, copiously, although now I wonder if we will see the likes of that again. Queer anarchist squats ran the fundraisers for women's peace camps, Trans women were working on the boards, setting up rape crisis centres. Queer punks did the DJing at Reclaim the Night, and we would all party together at the women's discos afterwards. And then these worlds that were my worlds, and they were not really totally separate in my experience, suddenly became subject to scrutiny from outside. And not only that, they were now appearing in the mainstream media. So you could think, oh, wow, you know, we've made it. You know, we're now... In the center, there we are. So what I then saw was the right-wing media, hate rags, you know, now suddenly pretending to be interested in lesbian book groups, tomboys, the identities of butch dykes, and language and symbols from cultures that I knew and recognized were being explained to this mainstream audience badly. <laughs> often completely wrongly or in bizarre ways and used as gotchas for whatever point was being made. It was like a window had been opened and now straight society was peering into our communities with a prurient interest, all the while pointing at us for being weirdos. And in the middle of all this as well, feminist theory and particularly radical feminism, which is one of the areas, few areas, that I actually do know a bit about, um, was being reduced and simplified in the mainstream. And there's nothing new about that, of course. We're all used to feminism being presented as something for T-shirts and tote bags rather than for life and liberation. We've seen the books on choice feminism and consumerism and neoliberalism. So far, so familiar. But now, radical feminism was being reduced and simplified in the media in order to attack and call for the rolling back of rights for another minority group, trans and transgender people. And the media set up the gender wars as being between feminists versus trans women in particular. So I wanted to correct some of the misrepresentations that I was seeing, and having been working away for quite a long time trying to do that for radical feminist theory in general, I felt that I had something to offer. And not to mention that as a big fan and a total geek for the second wave of feminism, I was horrified to see the term TERF, standing for trans-exclusionary radical feminist, shifting into public discourse and becoming a term applied to anybody regardless of their politics, regardless of whether they are feminists of any school or type, regardless even of whether or not they are Donald Trump I've seen being described as a turf, as a trans-exclusionary <laughs> radical feminist. Like, well, I mean, a great, you know, representation there for the sisterhood. Um, <laughs> the term emerged actually from a radical feminist message board in the early 2000s where it was developed simply as a shorthand acronym in discussions about whether or not radical feminists were working with trans women or not. And that origin story in itself highlights that there is no one generic radical feminist stance on trans inclusion or exclusion, but not that you would think that from how we see the term used today. But I have to just relinquish all the feminism textbooks there and acknowledge that, you know, the genie is out of the bottle. Um, I can't be going around talking about the theoretical trajectories and splits of revolutionary feminism, cultural feminism, lesbian feminism, differences between women-only organizing and separatism, you know, to all and sundry all the time. So you just have to accept that TERF has now become this generic term to apply to anyone with vocal trans-exclusionary views. And it's widespread, not least on social media, and is likely not going away. And another reason I wanted to write about what I saw going on was because I also felt that having a background in feminist activism and professionally having worked in policy and training against male violence against women and children, that maybe I could not be so easily written off by those opposing trans rights as being ignorant to women's rights or being naive to the issues at hand or anti-feminist. 
Of course, my background hasn't stopped such accusations, and I'll come back to that later. Obviously, there is a price to be paid for putting one's head um, above the parapet. So I've written for um, national newspapers on this issue, done media interviews, radio, TV, panel debates. And when my book first came out, it was reviewed in The Guardian with an interview, which I was obviously very grateful for. But <laughs> this is an example of what um, taking your, you know, your research, your academic work out into the public sphere looks like, because with the media, there's no editorial oversight. You don't get to approve the content before it goes out there into the world. And you certainly don't get to choose the headlines. Uh, and I would never have chosen that headline. And I never said any such thing. Um, it's individualizing. But the media love to individualize. And they love to make whatever someone is saying about a story into a story about them. So engaging with the media at all is accepting these sorts of simplifications and being ready for the risk of misrepresentation and attack. So whenever I do public events or publish in the mainstream on uh, trans rights, I receive hostility. It won't be news to anyone else who comments on this issue, whether that's on social media or comments pages or whatever, and it won't be news to anyone working in feminism either. And I don't even get that much of it. Um, I know people receive far, far worse, not least um, trans women who dare to speak up at all about their own lives, or people who are working in activist and research organizations, um, you know, monitoring the gender wars and studying law and policy on the backlash, like volunteer researchers in trans safety network, for example, and the abuse that you see and those organizations getting. So I've had to become used to being called a child abuser, a safeguarding risk, a handmaiden, a men's rights activist, a sellout, a rape apologist, a former feminist. And anyone speaking up for trans rights at some point will be called a paedophile or a paedophile apologist. And frequently people will respond to my articles in the comments saying, please should check my hard drive uh, for child pornography. They contact my employer, they report me as a risk. And sometimes I do try and kind of counter this and I get kind of dragged into things. And the irony is that as a feminist, I don't even use the P word, paedophile, because I call child rapists and child sex abusers what they are, which is child rapists and child sex abusers. But I'm drawn into these countless back and forths on social media about whether, you know, all queer theory is just pedo-apologism, or whether all those working in queer theory are pedos themselves, or whether Judith Butler, you know, is actually the devil or not. <laughs> yes, it's wild, but this is where we seem to be. Um, and it's not just online. I also get complaints to settings where I do events. So I have started censoring myself and restricting my own free speech out of courtesy to organizers when I'm doing talks, for example, that may be nothing to do with my area of research, but their outreach about how to get into university, or I'm visiting a school talking about sociology to sociology students and what a degree might involve. And if that goes public, the schools will be spammed and messaged. They'll get safeguarding emails. I'll be reported as a risk to the students, um, a danger to young minds. And after taking part in a panel on masculinities once, where, as it happens, I was the only speaker to talk about the well-being of boys and young men and the normalized levels of violence um, that men are subjected to, Ironically, a formal complaint was made to the VC of the university holding the event, claiming that it breached equalities law because I was a misandrist and that I should be reported to social services because a feminist like me should not be allowed to be a parent, which I am, and should not especially be allowed to raise a son. That's me and my son as he was then. <laughs> um, and I feel a bit cheesy putting that up there, but... On the other hand, I suppose I wanted to make it clear that when I'm, you know, we're busy researching all this backlash and studying what's going on, you know, around Europe and around the world, 
it is, it, it is things that affect me. It is things that would affect me and my family. So in some countries, I would not be allowed to be recognized as the parent of my child. I wouldn't have been allowed to register my children's birth. You know, those of us in the LGBT community are now having to see, you know, LGBT travel organizations warning us not to go to certain places or not to go to certain states in America because they can't guarantee our safety or next of kin rights or something if something happened. So. It is real, and, and it is quite extreme. And I know for all of us, the work we do, we, we do because we care about it, and it's something that we feel passionate about. And I know many of you obviously also work on sensitive topics and controversial topics. And we can see that from looking through you know, our conference program, although it's like this now, <laughs> and not like this, which I preferred, but anyway. Um, but when you do that, you see the diversity of all the current and urgent issues that colleagues are working on. And I know all of that work takes a toll, and I know that you are out there researching the horrors of loads of things, national borders, immigration policy, abuse, inequalities, violence. And I know those of you, those of us, and me too, in teaching positions, we're doing this research, reviewing, writing, editing, all this kind of labor, alongside the work we do in seminar rooms and lecture theatres as well. So like many of you, I'm doing my public engagement work alongside a full-time teaching role and wrote the latest book um, in successive summer holidays outside of the teaching timetables. So I don't know about you. Uh, maybe you share my sentiments when I say that I'm tired. We've had a bit of a shit time lately, haven't we? I expect we're all tired. Um, we're tired from being forced out on, to, on strike by the conditions in our sector. Um, we're tired of worrying about how we'll cover our assessment topics when we get back, how our students are going to react. We've lost pay. For those colleagues in hourly paid roles, which is how most of us began our careers in academia and certainly how I began mine, they have lost the total pay for the many days out on strike. And as we know, it's not a holiday. It's not doing nothing. We're anxious about what we'll return to, how our workplaces are going to react, what hostilities or punishments may follow. And many colleagues around the country, maybe way too many of you even in this room, I know will be worrying about whether or not you will even have a job, whether your module or even your whole department is going to continue. And we know that this is a pressing problem for those of us in the social sciences in particular. And this is part of a concerted government attack against higher education, especially against the post-92 universities, I feel. And it is an attack on critical thinking itself. And this government wishes to reserve that for those for whom critical thinking is a temporary hobby rather than a tool for one's own liberation. And that, of course, is not surprising. So we're used to being told that our degrees are Mickey Mouse degrees, and this faux outrage at the social sciences seems to be recycled every so often in recent generations. And now it's being pumped out in the context of the culture wars. So we're critiqued for all the usual things, but then we're critiqued for wokeism as well. And we're told that our degrees should be worth less. Branding them worthless compared to courses that produce high-earning graduates. As if we should be embarrassed that our students often seek to pursue jobs and careers in social justice, in community building, in charities, in the activism of social work or teaching or counselling, as if we would in any way see that as a failure, when in fact that is the very bones of sociology to foster critical thinking, to share a journey with questioners, to study the world as it is and research the world how it could be. And it is a success and a credit to all of us that so many of our students are inspired to pursue these sorts of roles. And that students of mine wish to build their careers in a way that bridges this gap between what is and what could be is a source of pride and accomplishment. It is not a poor outcome, it is not low value, and it is not worth less. It is not us who should be embarrassed that society devalues this work. It is not us that should be embarrassed that successive governments have decided that this work should be low paid 
and low status. The intent to do good work for good is not a problem of graduate outcomes. It is a problem of good work being paid poorly. It is a product of the steady erosion of the third sector, of community knowledges, and the devaluing of the welfare system. And our students see all of this too. And they also see their bank balance and the red line of debt that they are forced to leave our establishments with. And yet, many of them still choose ethical jobs and careers in social change, and I am proud of every single one of them, and we all should be. So in this context, it is, of course, frustrating to see headlines suggesting that, just like our colleagues in schools are subjected to, but with a much greater ferocity, that we are lazy, that we are work shy, that we did nothing over the pandemic lockdowns. And that's especially frustrating when we're doing our research and public engagement in our spare time, then seeing the headlines suggesting that all we're doing is actually brainwashing young people, censoring the students in our classrooms, that there's some kind of deficit of free speech in our universities, that students can barely speak for fear of not being woke enough in our classrooms. Well, I don't know about you, but what, what I see is students that can barely stay awake, hopefully not because of my boring droning on in my lectures, um, but because they've been out of work. They've been working a night shift at a supermarket, or they were working behind a bar, or they're out in the morning doing deliveries. We're told our students fear speaking up in our seminar rooms, but what I see is students who can't even get to campus because of the high rents in the city, they're forced to live further and further away, facing expensive and unreliable commutes on public transport to even get in to seminars and lectures. I see students who can't get onto campus to join in debates because they can't afford childcare, students who can't attend because they're taking on more and more low-paid part-time work to fund their studies, and then they end up in a position where they miss lectures because they can't afford to turn down shifts. I see students who were traumatized by years of their young lives being lived through a global pandemic. Students who are carers for parents or siblings, navigating disabilities and illness themselves, who are struggling with bereavement, with the loss of young friends to death by suicide. Students who can't afford food shopping or heating or computers or books. And increasingly, of course, it's not just students in these positions, it's staff too. And to return to how I began this talk, yes, it is right to be sensitive in our teaching, and yes, it is absolutely right to inform students when we're teaching on sensitive issues, and if that's called trigger warnings, so be it. These real things are what stop students taking part in university life, not crass buzzwords and clickbait headlines bemoaning free speech, and I await the office for students deciding to change the whole NSS to ask students about those things. So my area of research is pretty much ground zero right now in these anti campaigns, and the voices that I platformed in my book and the lives um, that I platformed are under threat. And we've moved far away from a country that in 2004 said, fair play to you, and voted for an out trans woman to win Big Brother. Can you imagine that happening now? A country that shrugged and tuned in to a trans character in Coronation Street for about 16 years in the late 1990s, that embraced the late Paul O'Grady as drag queen Lily Savage on primetime and breakfast TV. Can you imagine that now? So we're far away from that. And while the majority of people, in reality, are more worried about paying their rent, keeping their home, feeding their families during a cost of Tory crisis, this government, along with right-wing organizations and the media, are busy whipping up a moral panic about trans people. And they've placed the lives of trans people, and to what extent those lives should be livable, or indeed, if they should even be lived at all, center stage in the middle of the void that is what is left of their mandate. So what I see actually unfolding is a burgeoning sex and gender conservatism, one that threatens us all, but all minorities and all women especially. 
And there's often blatant misinformation being used in this backlash against the progress of LGBTQ rights and representation. It's hard to keep up with at the moment because it's constant. You could spend your days just trying to correct the most obvious scaremongering. I'll just give you an example of one that happened a couple of years ago, and you might remember seeing it. So this was covered in all the press. It was discussed on Piers Morgan, it was on Breakfast TV, it was in the headlines. And it was that Brighton NHS had banned words like mother and breastfeeding. And this story ran for, I think it ran for about two or three days actually, and was widely covered. What had actually happened was that Brighton and Sussex had produced a resource for midwives and health professionals who were working with trans and transgender and non-binary parents and families, detailing some of the terms in use in those communities, different terms for identities, how they might work sympathetically with those families. It wasn't a dictate for all maternity services, and it never meant that all women popping into their local GP were going to be referred to as a birthing person or a chest feeder. That was not the suggestion. But of course, none of that reality actually made it into the press. None of that was the story. And different versions of that same thing are really being told every day, but just about different settings and sectors where supposedly words are going missing. Terms are disappearing, they're being erased. And it's easy to look at some of that stuff and just think, well, you know, that's nonsense. What bizarre coverage. But it matters. It's being presented as a zero-sum game. And what has actually been happening, slowly, 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 is not that some groups are having terms stolen away from them or that majority groups are suddenly not being named anymore. But what has actually happened is that groups who never had names, who never had terms to describe themselves and their families, lives and relationships, who were never seen, who were actually literally erased in law and who never featured in culture, were now finally getting names, are now finally being recognized, are now finally being seen. Another example, more recently, just in the last few weeks, is the government announcements about a review of their own conservative, still fairly new, relationships and sex education RSE curriculum in schools. And the government is going to look into it with urgency, knee-jerk responding to what is an outrageous and often slanderous panic that is being stirred up around what schools are teaching children about LGBTQ lives and identities and these are still running now, these stories about inclusion and equalities. The government announced the review just before schools broke up for the Easter holidays. And there are outright lies being told about LGBTQ education, organisations and resources. School resources that have been produced for older teenagers are being shown in the press with the suggestion that they're being used in primary schools. Those working in education consultancy who also do consultancy for adult groups who are or maybe working as sex therapists, for example, with adults, have the media trawling through their websites in the section for the work they do with adults, and they're taking bits of that out and quoting it in an article on what on earth are our children being taught in schools these days. And groups working on equalities and inclusion, you know, have to try and correct all of this and they might be given a few seconds to supposedly justify themselves, knowing full well how they will be treated in social media if they do go public and make any comment at all. And as I said, it would be a full-time job just trying to correct the most outrageous falsehoods, never mind all of the conflations and the misrepresentation. And it is interesting, of course, and I think it does speak volumes, that we have to spend so much time defending ourselves and persuading the public that a certain case didn't actually happen, or it didn't happen like that, or that storybook wasn't actually used with younger children, etc., etc., etc. And it's depressing that we have to defend ourselves at all, because what this shows is that large swathes of mainstream, straight society still need persuading, and still think that there might be something in those stories. And it is offensive, and it invokes ancient and tired tropes about lesbian and gay lives to have to spend our energy 
convincing people that no, no, that gay person didn't actually go into a primary school and teach little children about adult sex acts. You know, no, no, we don't actually take our own children to adult porn shows. Why would you think that we would? But the fact that sadly, so many people seem to think, well, maybe we would, and need persuading about it, actually just shows how deep-rooted homophobia still is in our society. I went to school under Section 28, which was brought in in 1988. And this is a clipping from a headline in the Daily Mail. It's in the main bit of the paper. It wasn't in some obscure section of it, you know, just right out there in the main daily national newspaper for all to see. From 1993. Now, I imagine that maybe that looks shocking to some of you, but that's what we grew up with then. In 1993, I was getting ready to leave school, go to college, and Section 28 would not be removed until 2003 in England and Wales. And when I was working in local government for a local education authority, I worked a lot with education librarians. And they told me that they'd kept back books and children's stories and lesson plans on lesbian and gay lives and rainbow families, waiting for a time when they would be able to use them again. They had had to hide them away because they were supposed to burn them. Literally, they were told to pack them up for incinerating. And I'll never forget standing in a small corner of an old school building in Islington and the excited librarian saying to me, I knew we'd use these again. I never burnt them. And this is an ancient history I'm talking to you about, or some sort of archive acetate. It's recent, and it's many of our lifetimes, and I don't want to see it happening again. And I'm worried that we are at a bit of a tipping point. In fact, I'm worried it's already happening. And of course, some commentators and activists have been warning about this for years, not least those in LGBT communities, saying, if you stand by and watch what's being done to trans people, you'll be next, often using that old analogy of the canary in the coal mine. It's a horrible analogy at the best of times, but imagine watching all that creeping discrimination seeping into the center ground so that your life, your family, your right to be recognized as a parent, a spouse, your civic freedoms, your basic rights are under question on the covers of the newspapers and running in the news every day. Now imagine watching all that and knowing that you come under the bracket of the canary. You're going first. Of course, it should always have been enough that this was happening to trans people. It should always have been enough that trans people's already meager rights were being threatened, were being marked for rollback. It should always have been enough to act regardless of who was next. And I know that for many minority groups, this has been Life as usual for a long time. I know many groups do not have civic freedoms, do not have basic rights, are scapegoated in the mainstream media and by state institutions. But why would we look at the fact of historic and current oppression, the maintenance of racism, sexism, homophobia, the political violence that is making and keeping people poor and think that the answer is more? But here we are. With rising reported hate crimes against LGBTQ communities, the recent murder of young teen Brianna Jai, bullied, lured to a park by two of her young peers and stabbed to death. With the recent murder of a man, a well-known drag queen, murdered after he left his pub where he was working in Cardiff city centre, beaten to death and left in an alleyway for his body to be found in the morning. A couple of summers ago, openly fascist groups like Patriotic Alternative picketed in our towns and cities across the country on sunny, ordinary afternoons, screaming and spitting in the faces of parents and toddlers going into drag queen story hours in their local libraries, shouting and screaming that gay equals groomer, that LGBT equals pedo, and not a peep from our government not a hint of outrage, barely a mention in the national press. And in this context, our Prime Minister 
uses visceral language like this, saying he will gut the Equality Act of trans rights, and indeed, in just the last week, has promised to deliver on that. Now, while I understand that there are differing views on things like drag queen story hour events, I would hope that we could all hold a line against rising fascism and emboldened racism on our streets once again, hold a line against it rather than a line with it. And the banners and slogans that such events get excited around are terms like gender ideology, gender theory, and genderism. And these terms have been studied and researched by talented sociologists like David Paternote, Graf and Coral Zook, Ruth Pierce, the special issue of Sociological Review, actually, by um, Sally Hines on the gender wars. These terms are useful, empty signifiers. They unite a broad range across different political tendencies, and they stand in for everything from being anti-abortion to hating refugees, to blocking divorce rights, or stopping laws against violence against women. So it is somewhat difficult to be optimistic. Binary ways of thinking are being presented as the only way of thinking, not that they seem to involve much thinking at all. And in fact, we seem to be called upon to do as little of that as possible. So we won't notice, while the government bleats about free speech and cancel culture, vice signaling with their bans on schools and colleges from talking about Black Lives Matter or Extinction Rebellion, and insisting that we teach clearly mythical and clearly aspirational so-called British values to our children in the national curriculum while banning the right to protest, the right to free assembly, the right to strike. And while fascists march openly in the streets again, Refugee detention centers are set on fire. Traumatized people seeking asylum are threatened with bomb scares. Violent mobs rioting outside the hostels and hotels they are detained in. Crowds throwing stones at volunteer RNLI lifeboat crews because they set off to rescue families drowning to death in the sea for trying to reach safety on our shores. And I see a theft of empathy and a replacement of potential with hate. So far, so depressing. <laughs> but I do try to cling on to what I see as evidence of hope out there, as things to be hopeful about. And whether people and power, like it or not, change is coming. Younger generations are embra embracing progressive social justice in their lives, in their language, their cultures. They work in intersectional ways. They're building their own communities and mutual aid. They build bridges between different groups, all working on different elements of justice. And that's one reason I can stay hopeful in the work that I do. And it's also why I'm so genuinely and geekily passionate about our subject that we all share and that we've all come here this weekend because to share it together. Because this is our area, isn't it? This is our turf. Sociology has given names to the workings of discrimination, has offered ways of seeing how power works, who it works for, and who it works against. And yes, the world is the way it is, but humans have built it so, as we know, and thus we can undo and we can rebuild. And every day in teaching, I see students excited to learn that the fractures that they've observed in society have whole theories around them, academic names, books. It gives them a language to explain what they see and what they experience and what they have survived. So yes, I do want to end on a positive note. There is much to be positive about. There is hope. Hope in all the wonderful work that we're doing in all of our universities and also our colleagues who are working in schools and colleges, the ones who send us future sociologists every year. And there is hope in the around 2,000 schools that we know of currently registered by the BSA as teaching A-level sociology. There is hope in the over 40,000 students who sit A-level sociology exams every year. And there is hope in the at least 46 schools that we could trace, that we know of, who are teaching A-level sociology right here in Manchester. And by the way, 
the plenary talks are all being recorded, including this one. They'll be on the BSA website for the schools and colleges to watch as well. So I hope they hear their shout outs now because the future of sociology is here with Natasha Kinder, head of sociology at Ernst and Grammar in Trafford, Greater Manchester. It's here with Alan Dobson, who is head of social sciences at Trinity High in Hume. And it's here with Teresa Devine, curriculum lead uh, for sociology at Xavier and College in Rush Home, shown here with her colleagues. Thank you to all of them, and thank you to you. It's such an honor to be here with you and to be up here. I can't quite believe it. Thank you for your time. Solidarity with you all. Thank you. <laughs>